But Ralph Gaither was at that time president of the Ford Foundation. And um, uh, Mr. Gaither had sent for me when I found it convenient to be in New York, asked me to call upon him at his office, which I did. And on arrival, after a few amenities, Mr. Gaither said, Mr. Dodd, we've asked you to come up here this today because we thought that possibly off the record you would tell us why the Congress is interested in the activities of foundations such as ourselves. And um, before I could think of how I would reply to that statement, Mr. Gaither then went on voluntarily and stated, he said, Mr. Dodd, all of us that have a hand in the making of policies here have had experience either with the OSS during the war or European Economic Administration after the war. We've had experience operating under directives. And these directives emanate and did emanate from the White House. Now, we still operate under just such directives. Would you like to know what the substance of these directives is? And I said, yes, Mr. Gaither, I'd like very much to know. <coughs> Whereupon he made this statement to me, namely, Mr. Dodd, we are here operate on si similar, in response to similar directives, the substance of which is that we shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that it can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. Well, parenthetically, um, Mr. Griffin, I nearly fell off the chair. I, I of course, didn't, but um, my response to Mr. Gaither then was, well, Mr. Gaither, I can now answer your first question. You forced the Congress of the United States to spend $150,000 to find out what you just told me. So why don't you tell <clears throat> I said, of course, legally, you're entitled to um, make grants for, the, for this purpose. But I don't think you're entitled to withhold that information from the people of the country to whom you're indebted for your tax exemption. So why don't you tell the people of the country where's what you told me? And his answer was, we would not think of doing any such thing. So then I said, well, Mr. Gaither, obviously, you forced the Congress to spend this money in order to find out what you just told me. Mr. Dodd, you have spoken before about uh, some interesting things that were discovered by Catherine Casey at the Carnegie Endowment. Can you tell us that story, please? Yes, I'm glad to, Mr. Griffin. Um, this experience that you have just referred to came about in response to a letter which I had written to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace asking certain questions and gathering certain information. And on the, on the arrival of that letter, Dr. Johnson, who was then president of the Carnegie Endowment, telephoned me and said, did I ever come up to New York? And I said, yes, I did, more or less each weekend. And he said, well, when you're next here, will you drop in and see us? Which I did. And again, on arrival at the office of the endowment, I found myself in the presence of Dr. Joseph Johnson, the, the president, who was a successor to Alger Hiss two vice presidents and their own counsel, a partner in the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. And Dr. Johnson said, after, again, amenities, Mr. Dodd, we have your letter. We can answer all those questions, but it would be a great deal of trouble. And we have a counter-suggestion. 
And our counter suggestion is that if you can spare a member of your staff for two weeks and send that member up to New York, we will give to that member a room in the library and the minute books of this foundation since its inception. And we think that whatever you want to find out or the Congress wants to find out will be obvious from those minutes. Well, my first reaction was they lost their mind. I had a pretty good idea of what those minutes would contain. But I realized that Dr. Johnson had only been in office two years and uh, the other, the, the, the vice presidents were relatively young men and counsel seemed to be also a young man and I guess that probably they'd never read the minutes themselves. And so I said I had somebody, I would take it. I would accept their offer. And I uh, went back to Washington and I selected the member of my staff who was on my staff, having been a, a practicing attorney in Washington, but she was on my staff to see to it that I didn't break any congressional procedures or rules. In addition to which, she was unsympathetic to the purpose of the investigation. Uh, she was a level-headed and a very reasonably brilliant, capable lady. And her attitude of, toward the investigation was, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, in the face of that sincere conviction of Catherine's, I went out of my way not to prejudice her in any way. But I did explain to her that she couldn't possibly cover 50 years of handwritten minutes in two weeks. So she would have to do what we call spot reading. And I blocked out certain periods of time to concentrate on. And off she went to New York. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following in the way of on, on dictaphone belts. We are now at the year 1908, which was the year that the Carnegie began operations. That year, the trustees meeting for the first time raised a specific question, which they discussed throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then, in 1909, they raised the second question and discussed it. Namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? Well, I doubt at that time if there was any subject more removed from the thinking of most of the people of this country than its involvement in a war. There were intermittent shows in the Balkans, but I doubt very much if many people even knew where the Balkans were. And finally, they answer that question as follows. We must control the State Department. And, they, uh, and then that, that very naturally raises the question of how do we do that? And um, they answer it by saying we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country. And finally, they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Then time passes, and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War I. And at that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report in which they dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to 
see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914 when World War I broke out. And they arrive at that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. And they realize that that's a pretty big task. So it's to them, it is too big for them alone, so they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education which is, could be considered domestic be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation and that portion which is international should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. So they approach four of the then most prominent teachers of American history in the country, people like Charles and Mary Byrd, and their suggestion to them is will they alter the manner in which they present this subject and they get turned down flat. So they then decide that it is necessary for them to do, as they say, build our own stable of historians. And, and then they approach the Guggenheim Foundation, which specializes in fellowships, and say, when we find young men in the process of studying for doctorates in the field of American history, and we feel that they are uh, the right caliber. Will you grant them fellowships on our say-so? And the answer is yes. So under that condition, eventually they assemble 20. And they take this 20 potential teachers of American history to London. And there they're briefed into what is expected of them when, as and if, they secure appointments in keeping with the doctorates they will have earned. And um, that, new, that group of 20 historians ultimately becomes the nucleus of the American Historical Association. And then toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants to the American Historical Association $400,000 for a study of our history in a manner which points to what can this country be, can it look forward to in the future. And uh, that culminates in a seven volume study book study, the last volume of which is, of course, in essence, a summary of the contents of the other six. And the essence of the last volume is the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency. That's the story that ultimately grew out of and of course, was what could have been presented by the members of this Congressional Committee to the Congress as a whole for just exactly what it said. And they never got the, to that point. This is the story that emerged from the minutes of the, uh, of the uh, Carnegie Fund. That's right. The Carnegie Endowment That's Fund. That's right. And uh, so... It was official to that extent. I see. And Catherine Casey uh, brought all of these back in the form of uh, dictated notes or verbatim readings of the uh, of the minutes. Undictable though. Are those uh, in existence today? I don't know. But if they are, they're, they're somewhere in the archives under the, under the um, control of the Congress. 
House of Representatives. How many people actually heard those? Or were they typed up, transcripts made? No. Of them? How many people actually heard those uh, recordings? Oh, three maybe. Myself, my top assistants, and Catherine. Yeah, I might tell you this experience as far as its impact on Catherine Casey is concerned. Well, she never was able to return to her law practice. If it hadn't been for Carol Reese's ability to tuck her away in a job with the Federal Trade Commission, I don't know what would have happened to Catherine, but ultimately she lost her mind as a result of it. Terrible shock, too. It's, it's, it's a very rough experience to encounter proof of these kinds.